Okay, welcome back to VMworld 2013. This is day three of three days of live coverage, live in San Francisco, California. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. This is theCUBE, our flagship program, where we go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise, get the, get the, get the, get the scoop of what's happening at VMworld. Enjoy my co-host, Dave Vellante. Torsten Volk is here, hi everybody. He is an expert in systems management. He's a research director at Enterprise Management Associates. Torsten, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for having me. So a lot of talk about uh, management. You, you know, Enterprise yeah. Management Associates, I know them a little bit, but uh, we're talking off camera a bit. You're not about who's got the best you know, flash drives or disk array or software-defined product or whatever it is. It's how do you manage that right. mess, right? Yeah. That's what you do. So you help your clients, which are presumably you know, end user community and a mix of vendors, I'm sure, as well, squint through all that complexity, right? But it's all about the application, as they said on stage at uh, yesterday's keynote, uh, the first keynote. It's all about how do we help the business units and their developers best manage the environment and best serve the business for competitive advantage. So what is the state of systems management today? I mean, even the name systems management is changing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what is the state of it today? I mean, you've got a situation where you have a lot of sort of bespoke system management tools and uh -huh. there's a lot of complexity, everybody sort of knows that story, but take us through that and, uh, and, and where we are today and where you want it to go. It's actually really interesting. Um, this, it's the tr traditionally we were looking at network storage and compute and how do we manage it? How do we make sure there's enough of everything? And today we get all of those crazy requirements pushed down from the business units. We get big data projects. We get DevOps requirements. We get all kinds of things that business users think they need to have, and they actually do need to have to have a competitive advantage. Now, uh, systems management has to react to that and be much more aware of the business service. Because again, what are we doing network storage and compute for? We are doing that all to enable an application at the end of the day. And the more we can refresh that application, the more we can push it out to our customers, the more the organization benefits. So is, uh, is, is, is systems management as a future, uh, uh, as a service in our future? <laughs> in other words, something that's embedded into the, uh, into the capabilities of the application that right. we're, we're developing as opposed yeah. to sort of an afterthought that's I mean, bolted on. Does it all talk about software-defined data center? You know, what's a software-defined data center? It is a virtualization of not a surf, uh, network storage and compute. Yes, sure, but that's kind of a mundane, probably insulting a million people right now, a mundane task because all you have to do is you have to abstract the uh, software from the underlying hardware and uh, make it programmable and put APIs, northbound APIs on, on there so that the application can provision what the application needs to provision. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really a, a much more dynamic discipline today. The software defined data center has been um, the, the message clearly from Pat Gelsinger. It's one of the top three priorities, software defined data center, hybrid cloud, and user computing. Uh, we had Sean Douglas on earlier from Service Mesh, and you know, he was an ex-CTO at EMC, ran EMC Ventures, and, and he just recently left to be CTO of Service Mesh, so he's kind of seen the landscape, and he was on earlier, he said something interesting. When you're at the top of the stack and you're doing orchestration, you got to be able to bridge legacy at the mm -hmm. same time enable kind of these greenfield applications, the mm -hmm. ones our kids see in the iPhone and, right. the, and the CIO say, hey, I want my right. iPad, right. I want my new app, and well, we don't have desktop virtualization. So you're seeing the trend clearly towards apps are coming, a lot of diverse apps, mm. <laughs> it's huge issues, right? So orchestration's an interesting issue, and a DevOps mindset, the app gets built head up front with infrastructure assembling on the fly. So that's an interesting concept. So what's your take on this orchestration market? Um, and automation obviously plays a big part of that. What's your, what are your, what's your research tell you? Yeah, that's exactly the point. The research tells me that the business units, they do not care what's going on in the data center. They couldn't care less about that I virtualized my network. <laughs> you know, what they care about is the abstraction that I put on top of the virtualized. So I have basically multiple layer of abstraction. I have my virtualization layer, then I have my cloud layer, and on top of that I have government governance and automation and orchestration so that I can actually fulfill business requirements. And the more I can connect to business systems with my, the more basically my IT operations becomes aware of business systems and business applications. And we were talking about a service mesh and there's other companies solving similar or other slightly similar problems from a different angle. But what they all have in common is they kind of give IT operations a shot in the arm and say, okay, you know, 
developers used to be your enemies, but now developers are actually becoming much, much more of uh, change agents. You know, they, they're becoming uh, people who are delivering to the business and IT operations is able to help them through things like application release applica uh, automation and uh, service mesh. Uh, abstraction and governance of a massively heterogeneous environment because at the end of the day, the CIO is a broker of services. Why is service mesh so successful? So Sean basically said, we have the only product really out there that does some of the promise of uh, software-defined data at an orchestration yeah. level. Um, that's a bold statement, we have to dig in and we'll check. It is a bold statement. Well, we're is, it go, we're, we're, is it true? Is it, is it, is it, <laughs> yeah, we're going to check the facts on that. Uh, um, as, so is it true, yeah. answer the question, is it true or false, or is it kind of true? And then answer, why is service mesh so popular? Why are they getting so much traction? It's very interesting, right? Because they started getting all this traction coincidingly with the Software Defined Data Center talk. That talk matured a little bit last year and like the beginning of this year we see Service Mesh with our customers pop up everywhere. Really? And people ask me, larger vendors ask me, I'm not going to name names obviously, yeah. so what do you think we of Service are. Mesh? <laughs> do, we, do we need to do something? And what do you say? Yes, <laughs> buy them. <laughs> That's what I say. No, I mean, they're actually doing some good yeah. work. Sean's, yeah. you know, and the founders there are super smart. I mean, Sean, I mean, he saw it all. He yeah. basically was the driver but behind the Nasira deal, so he gets what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, they solved the problem, and it's always a tricky question, you know, are they the only people doing a certain thing, addressing a certain problem? I would say, I'm not going to say yes. I'm going to say they are the, people that focus on government the strong on governance the strongest of all of the vendors in the marketplace i can say that that's a fair statement there's no other company that is really focused that is building their company on governing massively heterogeneous environments along the lines of an application and is that a key need absolutely and is vmware in need for their virtualization stack to have a solution like that, a complete their virtualization stack, absolutely. We had Joe Arnold on and Josh McKinty who are heavily involved oh. in the OpenStack. So you got the CEO of Piston Cloud and the CEO of SwiftStack. Great mm -hmm. guys, um, we've done some great commentary with them. Um, you know, they're like, hey, you know what? It's all about a, the right tool for the job, right? So yeah. what's interesting about what they're saying and what kind of Sean is pointing to is that there are going to be multiple versions of the truth in this cloud and it's all going to be different by use case. So when you start talking about automation, one customer's processes that need to be automated are different than the other, right? right? So okay, that's man, do you manually document that and how do you automate that? So you have to have the ability to have a foundation mm -hmm. and then kind of like a service catalog push button. I want a little bit of that and blend it together and then you got a solution. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the mindset. So if that's the case, DevOps is interesting because DevOps, I, I call DevOps guys the guys who were eating glass early on, you know, Facebook, <laughs> building their own, <laughs> tough as nails, I don't need no ops guy, I'm going to do it all, and, but now you're seeing more of, I'm a developer, I just don't want to deal with infrastructure. Right. So now the mindset is, DevOps mindset is, I got an app and I need infrastructure to be, to be working. Yeah. But what Josh was pointing out and what, what, uh, what Piston and SwiftStack do is that there's a lot of details that need to be fixed that some developers are like, I don't want to do that, so that's mm. sad, it's yeah. too much work, you know. Positive no. compliance, LDAP integration, right. you know, this little stuff that matters. Yeah. So how do developers or enterprises protect against something, ah, I'm not going to build that. Yeah and causes a security hole well, or something. There has to be that scary term, no ops. I don't know if you've heard of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, you know, kind of makes a whole profession <laughs> obsolete. <laughs> and uh, pe a lot of people took that the wrong way because, I mean, what they really meant by no ops was that developers can really truly describe in their code the, <coughs> in all of its details, and there's a lot of nitty gritty details that you and I, you know, couldn't understand without actually doing the job, you know without going into the data center and figuring out what it means to configure that SAN in a way that it best runs with a certain switch and application at a certain point in time, you know? So um, it, it has been kind of painted as that scary thing and NoOps was kind of the culmination of that. And now I think we have a little bit of a pushback from IT operations, you know, saying, look, you rely on us for keeping your business, for keeping the lights on, so uh, you got to give us something. And IT operations, for the first time, based on our research, really interesting, we see uh, IT operations is actually starting to listen to business units, to developers, a lot more because they see they need to. Because if they don't, we see massive shadow IT deployments, you know, it was all over the news, yeah, I believe, sure. in the New York Times. Hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on uh, credit cards on EC2 without the IT organization knowing and what kind of data is there and what a liability that is. 
You know, and that's what companies like Service Mesh come in and take that liability away from you and put it back into the data center. So your research is showing that DevOps mentality moving into the traditional enterprise. I mean, it's, you know, obviously it's well understood mm -hmm. what's going on in the hyperscale. And, and we've actually, John, on, on, on Wikibon, we've had the peer insight with a company, Munder Capital, you know, financial services firm, they're doing DevOps, but right. how prevalent, Torsten, is that in, in your findings? Companies know they have to do something. And you can see when you go to the big four shows as well, you know, traditionally not known as necessarily the incubators of innovation, you see a lot of this type of talk, a lot of CIO as the service broker. You know, the CIO is really rethinking, and there's a new generation of CIOs, rethinking their roles in terms of being aware we have to compete. And if you don't compete with the external services, people will go somewhere else, mm -hmm. and they're the business people. They are more important than we. We are supposed to enable them. And that is kind of this traditional shift. And it's a very cultural thing, you know. If you have been in your job, if I've been in my job, somebody tomorrow tells me, man, you know, you should have done this differently, mm -hmm. or you should do this differently. Torsten, I got to ask you, we gotta, we're up on the break here, we're getting the, the hook, but I got to ask you a final question um, as more on, on your, your current role as a research analyst. And David, I always joke about this. Well, I use the word moving train, the market's like a moving train. It's hard to you know, get a hold of something. How do you cover the systems management space when the, uh, the systems themselves are being re-architected? I mean, you're seeing yeah. a lot of these guys that are leading the, the engine, they're systems system operating systems guys. So you got a complete rehaul and, and re-architecture of systems. Mm -hmm. So now the systems manager is supposed to manage pre-existing systems, so yeah. it becomes a moving train. So how do you cover it? I mean, how do you get your hands on it? You well, just get on the train, and just ride well, it. You, you start with the customer. That's that's the main thing. You don't start talking to the vendors. You start uh, believing in your research and getting as many customers in there and finding out what their pain is. You know, go to customers and talk about the SDDC. Customers are not like you and I thinking about this 24/7. Customers have specific problems that kill them, that make them late for their kids, for their dinner in the evening, you know? And uh, that's where you start. So customers tell you, wow, you know, I can provision 500, or this vendor came to me, said I can provision 500 VMs in one minute, under one minute, 500 VMs. Awesome, you know, but it's not the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. It's not an Olympics of yeah. provisioning VMs. Yeah, right. oh boy. If you don't have your uh, network, if you don't have your security. Fun with provisioning. Right. Yeah. If you don't <laughs> I'm not coming home for dinner. We join the queue again all night long again. <laughs> thanks so much, Dorsten, for coming on the queue. Dorsten Bolt, thanks for coming on. Service Mesh, uh, good, good example there. Great job. Uh, Shout out to them. Uh, and, their, and their role, Sean Douglas was on earlier, appreciate it. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angle's ex exclusive, extensive coverage, three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We're day three, um, <laughs> just again, we're going to have Sanjay Poonin up at one o'clock. He's going to be uh, talking about the end, he came from SAP, friend of theCUBE. Uh, we also have Tarkin Maynard, who's a CUBE alum, who's going to announce some, break some news, so stay tuned here. He's got a new startup, and uh, always a, a flamboyant and knowledgeable guest up next. Stay with us. <laughs>